Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the American Library in Paris. For those of you who are just discovering the library, we're an independent nonprofit in the heart of Paris, actually in the sort of in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. And we are the largest English language lending library on the European continent. Uh, even more than that, we're also a very vibrant event space. And so typically we host many events per week, um, all the way from so the, the smallest children to adults. Uh, we're gathering on Zoom for the for the current period, of course, just to stay safe. But we've been really, really impressed with your commitment to continue to attend our events. So thank you for, for bearing with us with this leap um, to a virtual setting. Um, 2020 wasn't all bad for us. I just wanted to share that we turned 100 last year. So we're officially 100 years old. We celebrated our centennial uh, mostly confined, I would say. We, <laughs> I see Victoria clapping there for us. Thank you. Um, we had a virtual gala, and so that was a wonderful opportunity for our, our donors to, to gather and support us. And I wanted to thank any of you in the audience who are donors and members, but also welcome to those of you who are completely new to the library. So this evening, we are just delighted to be hosting Victoria V.E. Schwab. We actually had an event planned um, a while back, and that was sort of spoiled by the various, um, various events of 2020, but we were really delighted to be able to reschedule. And thank you to Victoria and your team for all of the flexibility, of course. So I'll begin by just introducing Victoria, as well as Kirsty, who will be our moderator this evening. Uh, Victoria V. E. Schwab is the number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 20 books, including the internationally acclaimed Shades of Magic series, the Villain series, the Cassidy Blake series, and more. Her newest book, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, follows, and she's gesturing to it in the background, perfect. I know kirsty has got a copy as well. Uh, so this book follows the title character across centuries and continents, across history and art, as she learns how far she will go to leave her mark on the world. And our moderator this evening is our very own Kirsty McCulloch Reed, who works here at the library with me. Uh, she is assisting in the Children's and Teen Services Department with programs, the collection, and social media. She holds a master's in information and library studies from Robert Gordon University. So thank you so much, both of you, for being here this evening. I'll, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Kirsty for the interview. Thank you so much, Catherine, and welcome to everyone. I just want to say first, I am very excited because I am a huge fan of Victoria's work, all of her work. Um, but I know a lot of people, as Catherine said, hadn't, hasn't, haven't read all of her books. So I would really like to keep this event spoiler free for everyone. So a lot of my questions are going to be about the writing craft and some more personal questions. Um, but I'm not going to ask specific questions about what happens to characters or the endings of books because I don't want to spoil anything wonderful for all of our readers. So welcome Victoria. As I said, I'm very, very excited. Um, I'm gonna ask a very kind of general question. Um, it was one of my favorites about what did you learn specifically from your first ever published book? And then what have you learned about yourself or your writing or anything um, from your most recent published? Oh my goodness, that's such a good question. And weirdly, I think you get to a point in your career where you feel as though you've been asked everything. And yet, I don't think I've been asked this before. And I think it's really interesting. Uh, obviously, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is my most recent novel, but something that many people might not realize is I have 20 books, but I first started publishing in 2011. So 10 years, almost exactly. And I had the idea for The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue before my first book came out. So I can speak to this with the caveat that my most recent book, Addie LaRue, is also in many ways one of my first stories. Uh, for those who don't know, I started quite early. I got my literary agent when I was 19. And it wasn't because I was very fancy. It was because I'm a very stubborn only child who decided I was going to do this um, come hell or high water, I was going to find a way. I wrote my first novel when I was in college. Terrible, terrible book. Thank gosh, it never got published. But um, I was a senior in college when I wrote The Near Witch, which would go on to be my first published novel. And what I would say is that I was, if you can't tell from that story, desperately impatient. I wanted so badly to be a published author. I wanted so badly to be taken seriously. I was in such a hurry. You know, and I think 
that just comes down to my personality of feeling like, and I see this a lot with young writers, with new writers, there's this pressure we put on our novels, specifically on a debut novel. This idea that your debut novel has to be the one that breaks you out, that makes you famous, that, you know, but aside from a couple notable figures through history, for the vast majority of us, our, our stories, our, our fame, our, our readership is made not by a single book, but by a body of work. And that is something I truly could not wrap my head around at 22. All I thought was, I have this book, The Near Witch, this weird little fairy tale about a village where a stranger appears one night and the following night, all the children begin to disappear one by one, this little fairy tale. But I was convinced this is my debut novel. This has to be the book that makes my career. Well, it didn't. And nor did my second and nor did my third and nor did my fourth, my fifth, my sixth, my seventh, my eighth novel. A Darker Shade of Magic, the, the black covers that you have behind you there, that was the first book that, quote, broke out. And even then, it wasn't a bestseller. It just happened to expand the readership. And so something I could not fathom, really until quite recently, was that those seven books that came before were each building the readership that would then embrace that eighth book. So you can't look at one book and think, this has to do everything. It shouldn't every single thing you write is a brick in the wall of your career. And so it's very surreal then to look at The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, technically my 20th book, and, and to see that while it's had this extraordinary success that I'm so grateful for, in large part that success was because of the 19 things that came before it. And so weirdly, I think they're both the same lesson, the lesson I couldn't seem to learn with my first book and the lesson I have learned with my most recent, which is that everything you do creatively is additive. There is no backward step. As long as you are creating, as long as you are making, as long as you are moving through art in that way, you are building something. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Um, building on that slightly then, um, you're saying like a good way forward is, you know, to build creatively. And there's no right way for everyone to do that. Everyone is slightly different. There's no prescribed way to be a writer or an author. Um, but can you talk a little bit about your process, about your like setup? Do you like a set time or place or listen to music or like how, how do you? Um, honestly, I try not to be too precious about rituals because this past year or so aside, I travel most of the year for work. And when you travel most of the year for work, you can't really get set in your rituals or else you won't have the ability to get work. If I can only write when the sun is at such an angle and I have this tea from this brewer and this mug, what happens the moment I'm in a hotel instead? What happens the moment I'm on a plane? And so I've worked really hard not to develop rituals. So what I can say though, is I have quite a strict system these days for how I go about finding my way through a story. And that's because anyone who has ever followed me online can guess this. I'm a very neurotic creator. I struggle with self-doubt, with my internal editor, with the voice in my head that's continually saying, if you can't make it perfect, don't make it at all. The irony there being that there is no such thing as perfect in any artistic medium. It is subjective. Um, one of the reasons Addie LaRue took 10 years to write is because I spent eight of those years convinced I couldn't do it right, so I shouldn't do it at all. Um, so what I do <laughs> when it comes to writing is find a way to convince myself not to quit. And the way that I do that is by having an outline, a, a shape of the story so that I know that I have enough plot, but most specifically, I have an ending. I always have an ending that I am deeply excited by because that way on good days, it's propelling me forward. I can't wait to get to this ending. It's going to be so good. And then on bad days, I can't quit because all I have to do is get to the end. And once you get to the end of something, you can make it better. You can't fix a blank page. You can't fix an incomplete thing. A lot of people have lost their self, themselves down that route of working over the same story again and again without ever hitting the end. And so I always say that having an ending is like taking a desert and turning it into a football field. It's still an amount of space you have to cross but it's a measurable amount of space. Whereas I think for me, because of my anxiety, because of my fears and self-doubts, without that plan, without that goal, 
I just feel like I'm standing at the edge of a desert with no idea how far ahead I'm supposed to go. How do you, how do you feel ready? Like when is an idea ready for you to outline? Like when is some thought about a character or a theme ready for you to be like, I'm gonna work on this outline and get to this ending? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, a lot of it is gut. A lot of it is feeling. For me, I, a lot of it is about having the right amount of story because you know you can write a short story and have a certain amount of plot that goes in, but to write you know a three, four, six, seven hundred page novel, it takes a certain amount of story. So having a, a kind of a strength of plot, having a sense of the characters. But I'll be very honest. Uh, I think people hear the word twenty novels and they think that I'm a fast writer. It's not. I'm a relentless creator, but the creative process itself is actually quite slow. And, and anyone who's watching or listening tonight, you're going to hear a huge number of metaphors because I have a metaphor problem. So this will be my next metaphor after the desert and the field is that I always look at my mind like a six burner stove. It's like a stove top. It's got six flames and I've got a pot on each and every one of those flames. And one of those pots is on high heat. I am actively cooking something there. But the other five spots, the, the pots that are on them are just simmering. So I probably spend a year to two years simmering an idea, adding ingredients to it, testing it out, making sure that it has a depth of flavor, love an extended metaphor, has, has everything that I need. And it's not that it has all of the right pieces because in the, in the act of writing a book, you discover all the things that you're missing. It's just that it has enough to carry it. I know that it has enough substance. I know that the characters excite me. And really then as far as which I choose to do and when, it comes down to what excites me. What can't I stop thinking about? Whatever story idea follows you to bed at night and out of bed in the morning is probably the one you should be writing. Um, definitely some of your stories have definitely followed me to bed and out of bed in the morning, so much so that I don't wanna to go to work. Um, I would like to ask next then, um, names for me, for a lot of people have a lot of power and associations. How do you decide on character names? Do they ever change? Is it something that's essential for you to begin or does it come with the story? It's interesting. I have a theme in a lot of my books of characters being assigned names or choosing names for themselves. So I'm very aware that names have an immense import. When it comes to choosing my characters' names, it's probably one of the only parts of the process that's a little metaphysical, that's a little, I can't always explain it. Sometimes a character comes with a name. Addie LaRue was always Addie LaRue. It just had a cadence that I loved. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I have to search for a character name. I'm working on the fourth book in the Shades of Magic series now, and I couldn't start it for a very long time because I didn't have a main character's name. I knew everything about her except her name. And I, so, and I can't give a placeholder name. For me, once a character has their name, it can't be changed. To do so would, would unravel the entire character. It, it becomes intrinsic. And I always like to say a great example of this is when I was born, I had no name for three weeks. My parents decided to basically like fill in a placeholder, if you will, because they wanted to live with me to figure out what I wanted to be called, right? They had two or three names that they were trying to choose between and they weren't sure what my personality would merit. So they kind of held off for a bit. And sometimes I'll do that with characters as I'm working through their personality. But the, once I start writing them actually in action on the page, the name can't change. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, to go back a little bit about how you write, like you're saying you're not like set in like a precious routine, but for certain scenes in your book, maybe more romantic or emotional, is there anything you do to get yourself in that kind of mindset to like embrace that feeling? It's interesting. Addie LaRue was a book written entirely out of order. And um, it was mainly because of that. Addie LaRue is a character driven novel with a lot of really deep emotional beats. You know, there, there is a scene, and I don't feel like this is a spoiler because I think it should be a fair warning. Like there is a scene wherein a character contemplates suicide and, and, and they don't go through with it. But that contemplation, one of the hardest scenes I've ever had to write. Um, 
and there are romantic scenes and there are more physically and emotionally aggressive scenes. And I couldn't just wake up on any given day and write one of those. And so I would write the chapter in Addie LaRue that I felt equipped to write that day. I had this extensive map of like 300 scenes. I knew all 300 scenes that were going to be in the book. And then it came down to almost imagining it like a shelf of books. And I would walk up each day to the shelf and think, which thing do I want to do today? And I would pick the scene off the shelf that I felt most equipped to write. So I, I very much am the kind of writer who, one of the reasons I plan so much in advance, one of the reasons I outline is so that when I sit down to actually create, I don't have to write from beginning to end. In that first draft, I can write to the emotional heart of what I'm trying to write that day, whether it's loneliness or connectivity or loss or hope, whatever it is. Okay. Do you find um, switching between writing out of order in that way, do you find it hard to fit it together? Is there a point where you're like, I've written this scene, but it doesn't follow, then this happens. And how do you work around that? I am such a rigid creator these days. I think probably I didn't have this system around my third or fourth novel, but now like my outlining is neurotic to an extreme. And, and so I'm lucky that most of the time the pieces fit back where they're supposed to. But that's all to say, that's just in the interest of getting a first draft. Once you go into revision, nothing fits anymore. One of the, okay, third metaphor, <laughs> I have such a problem, I'm sorry. Is that like, for me, one of the reasons writing is so hard is you have an idea. And this idea in your head is like a beautiful glass orb right? Filled with light. It's, it's perfect. It's just flawless. And the act of writing a story down is the act of taking this beautiful radiant glass orb and smashing it against a wall really hard. And what you end up with is all of the shards that were technically there and none of the light. And then the act of revising is painstakingly finding a way to fit the orb back together and hope that it kind of resembles the idea in your head. So I think you have to look at first drafts as just that. They're first drafts. They're moments to get all of the pieces, all of the raw material. But revision, rewriting, revisiting, taking a thing back apart and looking at how it's working, that's where you get the light. That's where you manage to rediscover some of the light that makes the story in the first place. So what is your favorite part of the writing process? Is it that? Is it finding the light again? Or is it something completely different? I have two favorite parts. My fav first favorite part is the brainstorming, the idea creation phase, when it's truly just all of the wheels in my head turning and thinking, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And then my other favorite part is the final polish, when I'm genuinely just putting like the last flourishes everything in between is awful. Like everything in between the brainstorming and the, I can't wait to just finesse this word is difficult for me. So I hold on to those two sides to survive everything in between. And it's not like that makes writing sound like such an unpleasant experience. I just, the nature of my relationship to creativity is the more books I write, the harder I get on myself, the harder, because you always have to write something flawed before you can make it better. But the more books you write, the more aware you are that you have that you are writing something flawed. So it's just difficult, but, but it is worth it for the rush you get when you end up with the finished product and you realize it's not the same thing you started with, but it's, it's wonderful in its own way. I'm gonna jump a little bit to a, a question I was planning on asking later, but you've kind of brought it up. How do you feel looking back on previous works that maybe now that you're more technically advanced in your in your craft, do you feel that, oh, I wish, is there a book that you wish that you had waited to write now that you are more advanced in your craft, like you did with Addie? Or were they the stories that you needed to write then and you're done with them and no matter what, how they are, they are what they are? You know, it's a slippery slope because of course, like from a craft perspective, you think, oh, that I would do that differently. But, you know, you have to remember, I was 22 with my first novel and 33 with Addie. Um, I think I never feel the urge to go back. The reason being a novel to the, a novel is one thing to the reader. But for me, as the author, a novel is a time capsule. It's not just the story that you're reading. It's who I was when I was writing it. 
So I look back at The Near Witch, which I had an opportunity, my first novel, I had a chance to go back and revise it if I wanted for when it came back out and came back into print seven years after it was first in print. And I chose not to because that's who I was, the story I wanted to tell and what I was capable of at 22. And so of course, I hope that I grow with each and every book. Like you hope that your first book is the worst book you ever write. That's, I mean, if you, that's the ideal. So I try to just look at every novel for what it is for me, in addition to the story I'm telling as who I was when I was writing it. And I can look back at Vicious, which is my first novel for adults. And I wrote it when I was 25. That is the most 25 year old me. Like I know exactly who I was. And then Vengeful is written five years later when I was 30. And the amount of living that I did between 25 and 30, the amount of self that I discovered is so visible between those two books that to go back and revise one would be to revise a portion of my own life. Yeah, that is very, makes a lot of sense. But um, I always think that, you know, if you could go back and change something, you would. And that's a hard thing to let go of. Well, I think it's just, when does it stop then, right? Like, yeah. at what point then are you you know, Stephen King just always kind of looking back to revisit something that's happened. Like, are you just trying to, because I could revisit it now at 33. What happens when I'm 43? Am I going to try and go back and do it again? Like how many, it's very much like a palimpsest, right? Like how many times am I going to write over myself? <laughs> so for a book um, like Addie that you are, so for those that don't know, Addie LaRue um, makes a deal with the devil and then uh, gets to live forever, but she's cursed to be forgotten. So covering a 300 year period of history in that book, how much of historical research did you do? Did you want it to be factually correct or was it just Addie's story and you were just building the history around that? You know, it's interesting. You do as much, I did as much research as I could while also trying to make story decisions for Addie. So uh, we, we ran into a really interesting problem early on, my editor and I, which was the question of, is this Forrest Gump? Like, is this the kind of narrative where Addie is encountering historical figures and changing the path? Mm -hmm. And I didn't want it to be that. And, and so Addie engages with art and artists through history. And and so what I ended up deciding to do, and I was like, okay, so is everyone going to be fictional or is everyone she meets going to be historical? And I essentially decided I'm going to do half. I'm going to make half of them historical, half fictional. I'm going to make half the places she goes historical and half fictional. I'm going to treat everything as half and half. And I'm going to write it all exactly the same in the hopes that readers won't always be able to tell the difference. And that's that happens now. I get emails from readers asking, where can I find Samantha Benning's paintings? I'm like, well, Samantha Benning doesn't exist, you know, or where's the fourth rail club in New York City? Well, that club doesn't exist. Well, what about the laundromat, which is this speakeasy in New York City, speakeasy arcade, absolutely real, you know? So like, I tried to find the, the lines to go on. Obviously she encounters some people like Frank Sinatra and then she encounters some entirely fictional people. And so I wanted to make stories that, I wanted to make decisions that were the best story for Addie because at the end of the day, I am a fiction writer. I am not a historian. That said, you do as much research as you possibly can. You will research, like I had entire books on the, um, like the Parisian salon scenes of the 50s and 60s and the 1700s. You do so much research and then you make the stupidest mistake possible. And then somebody catches that mistake and you fix it and it still goes to print with the mistake in it. So like there are like three small mistakes and everyone always emails me to be like, did you not notice this? And I'm like, I did, and I fixed it. And then there are so many people who touch a book in the course of copy editing it, that it somehow got unfixed. And then for better or for worse, Addie LaRue went into reprints so quickly that it was like the fourth printing before a couple of the mistakes got caught. And people were like, wow, that's such a stupid thing. And I'm like, you don't understand. When you're dealing with like 1700 facts over the course of this novel, three of them got through and I am a fiction writer. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you still will make mistakes and you will, though that's how typos end up in books to be quite frank for anyone wondering is that you have like 12 editors passing a book through. But my favorite, and I'm embarrassed to say this at American Library of Paris because this is a mistake 
that got corrected in everything except one edition. So one edition still has this mistake for like the fourth printings. And I was, I was so proud of myself. This, this, this mistake got caught in galleys in pre-publication copies. Remy, who exists in the 1750s, one of Addie's earliest love interests, they have this beautiful night together. And he, in the arc, in the advanced copy, takes her up the steps of the soccer cur. Because I had only been to Paris, I had been to Paris like five times, but soccer cur, as someone who's not a Parisian, feels steeped in, in history. You think like, this would absolutely happen. And of course the soccer cur had not, would not be built for another 150 years, right? And so it was changed to Notre Dame and it was changed in the galleys and yet two editions, one edition of it still got out with this. And I just was like, I live in France. I live that was the, I don't want to say mistake, that was the thing yeah. I noticed. And I was like, yeah. okay, well, maybe this is, you know, you're taking liberties no. in my mind. And that was totally fine for me. But that was my, that was where this question came from. Caught it, and it was caught by a keen-eyed reader in early galleys, but we were moving so quickly through the process because to get out of the to publication in the pandemic, all of, and I'm not trying to make excuses, but it's a fascinating behind the scenes look in that like during the pandemic, all of our productions in the States, especially all of our book productions got shut down. So to get a book to print, it had to be ready like five months in advance. And Addie had not been scheduled to be ready until three months in advance because we, we didn't need it to be. And so all of these things happen where you start rushing the, the corrections through and then wondering which printing. So I have editions which are like technically fourth printing that still have a mistake that was caught in galleys because they had to go back to printing so quickly. So I will live with these mistakes. <laughs> well, as you've taken liberties elsewhere, like the timeline is totally fine. Um, so I'm going to move on to some other questions because I have a lot and yeah. we don't have that much time. Yes, I will speed up my answers. No, you're, we love listening to you. Um, what has been your favorite book to write? Just the joy of writing. Yes, I don't think I can call Abby my favorite because it was so emotionally fraught. I will say Vicious and there's a very specific reason. For anyone who doesn't know, Vicious is a supervillain novel. It is the story of two young men in pre-meds pre so in medical, before medical school in the United States, and they discover that the key to superpowers is near-death experiences. And they set out to manufacture their own powers by controlling their own deaths and resurrections. And it goes horribly wrong. And the reason that book is my favorite is at the time I was writing it, everything in my career was going wrong. I was only 25. I had a publisher, uh, my first publisher, basically told me I was a failure. They, they canceled a series of mine uh, called The Archived. I was losing hope and losing creative energy. And I felt like, you know what? I'm just going to write a book for me then. Like, I'm just going to write whatever I want to read. Because you enter publishing and you think, I can make this work. I'll figure out what other people want to read. And I was like, no, I have to figure out what I want to read. And so I decided to write the strangest thing that would please me. And that was essentially an, a Magneto Professor X, like friends to enemies, supervillain story. It was so strange. I was convinced it would never get published. My own agent was deeply concerned when I pitched it to her. And because I had nothing to lose at this point, because I was just writing for an audience of one and that audience was me. I just had such a fabulous time writing it. And it turned out that book would change my entire career, not because it was the most successful, because it taught me that if you write for yourself, if you write for an audience of one, even though that's so specific, other people will see themselves in it too. And so that's a, a rule that I've espoused with every single book since, whether I'm writing for 10 year old me in City of Ghosts, or 33 year old me and Addie or 27 year old me in a darker shade. I'm just writing for a version of me. Do you ever consider if you're writing for yourself to a point, but do you ever consider like the, what you want your readers to take away from it while you do that? Do you aim for certain feelings or are you just, this is a story I want to tell. This is what I need to get out. No, I think the plot is the part I write for me and specific like I look at, so you've got our dark duet behind you, the Savage Song, which is the first book in that. I wrote for 17 year old me. 
And I know, because the thing is, I don't know how, who anyone else was at 17. I was deeply depressed in an all girls preparatory school, losing my mind, feeling just anger at the world. I was deeply closeted and I just, I had, I was shutting down. So I knew that that's who I was gonna write that book to. But at the same time, I go into every book with an idea or a feeling or something I want everyone else to take away from it. It's just, you have to remember that for an author, we will live with a book for a very long time before anybody else reads it. You know, Addie, 10 years, uh, Darker Shade was only like two or three, but for two years, nobody else saw a word of that. So you're engaged in a kind of one-on-one -on -one experience with your work for a very long time before it becomes consumable by anyone else. I wanna come back to world building because you talked about the monsters of Verity and um, a darker shade of magic. And those worlds are so complete, they're so lush, sumptuous red London, the exposed white London. Um, and how, so how do you get into that? How do you become the architect of that world? Do you like live in it? Do you create like a physical outline of that or maps or? It's like you want me to use another metaphor because I'm going to use another metaphor, which is I think there are two kinds of world builders. I think there are world builders like Tolkien who design you a house and they design every single room of that house and every single furnishing of every room, every decoration and the grounds, every detail. And if it isn't there, it doesn't exist. And then there are people like me who design you a house and don't let you inside. So all you can do is look through the window and maybe you see one room through that window and you see just enough furnishing that you then as the reader have to be able to guess what the rest of the house looks like, but you don't see the entirety of it. I always try and design worlds that feel like the beginning, but not the end. Like I design entry points into a world. And that's because I like specificity. I wrote, I wrote a series, The Archive, that takes place basically entirely in one building, like in a, in a hotel turned apartment building. I, I love place. I love setting as character. And when it comes to world building, I like designing intuitive rules. I like growing magical systems, even vicious. The superpowers were grounded in medical science. It was medical science taken one step past what we have evidence for, but it tried to hug close. With the, the uh, Darker Shade of Magic, I wanted to design multiple worlds, but instead of making them different places, I wanted to give different philosophies to the same place and say, how does magic evolve in a world that embraces it, in a world that rejects it, in a world that forgets it? What does that look like? So for me, it usually starts with a rule. Some like for uh, the Savage Son and Our Dark Duet, it was what if violence began to breed actual monsters? So everything kind of starts with a world building what if. And it's very important to me to pick and choose. I never want anything to be possible. I always say you're never going to see dragons in the Shades of Magic series. Like I have picked what aspect I want to look at and grow. But yeah, I try to make it as intuitive as possible. Um, do you have a favorite? favorite character in your book? I know that's like asking you to pick your favorite child. <laughs> and I know that's a tough question. Um, or a character you relate to the most. I mean, I can pick, there's always one in each book. For Addie LaRue, it was Henry. Henry is the character in Addie LaRue that I built on me. Uh, in the Savage Song, it was August. In the Shades of Magic series, it's Holland. In Vicious, it was Victor Vale because I wrote him as me. He was, again, that book was just for me. So it didn't matter that Victor was me. Um, in City of Ghosts, it's Jacob. Like I always have somebody, but it's not always that they're the easiest character to write. It's just that I feel closest to their emotional truth, whatever that is. Again, asking to pick from your children. Do you have a, a favorite, a particular scene or a particular moment in any of your books that you're like, this is for me is joy or wonder or awfulness, but it's your favorite. I probably, again, I think it, it's different for each novel. And it's weird because there, there are scenes that I just adored writing because they made me smile. And I felt like just having an enjoyable moment. And then there are scenes that I knew were doing a lot of work. I was proud of the scene. So for instance, in The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, the worst night of Henry's life 
which comes to be a, a very important beat, I waited seven years to write. Like I knew exactly the shape of it and I was so scared of actualizing it, but I knew if once I could get it, like if I could get it right. Um, there's something that happens at the end of our dark duet that I fought with my editor for, for months. Cause I was like, here's what I want to do. And she said, you can do it, but if it's not utterly devastating, you will have wasted the book. <laughs> so I think there are moments like that. So it's not that I enjoy them in the creating. It's that like, there's a, like a seminal point in each book that I know I desperately want to get to. I want to come back to Vicious because that is my favorite book of yours. Um, it wasn't the first one I read, but it was the one that I fell in love with immediately. Um, in that book, this is not a spoiler for anyone, as you said, that the characters gain these particular abilities, powers through experimentations with near death experiences. When myself and the staff members at the library that I passed it around read it, we then played the game of if we were to become extraordinaries, what would our death experience be and what would our powers be? Um, and that's a lot based on, you know, personality, how you die, what you're thinking at that point. Did you do your own? Oh, of course. <laughs> First of all, I need to know yours. Um, so Morgan, who is our advancement uh, manager at the library, did mine. We were doing it for each other. Um, little random background story is that I was hit by a car here in Paris a couple of years ago. And so Morgan's idea was that um, I was hit by a car again and thought, oh no, not again. <laughs> and <laughs> then had the ability to like rewind time, like play time over again. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'll let it go to him. Um, so yeah, what would yours be? Yeah, so um, I've always wanted the ability to control time, but only moving forward. Because I think when we look at stories, all the problems happen when we try to go backwards, right? Like everything happens badly when we go in reverse, but all as a reader and a writer, all I want is more time. And so I think probably it doesn't matter how I would have died, as long as my last thoughts were, I need more time. Like I'm not ready because I want my gift to be the ability to pause, slow down and speed up. So it's never about going backwards, but I would love to just hit pause for a year and read. I would love to speed up through like a just brutally unpleasant day. I would love to slow down and savor a moment more. So I would like to control time with the understanding that I can't go back. Okay. Um, I want to ask a few random personal questions. So I didn't really introduce myself to our audience at the beginning. Um, I'm the one of the children's and teens librarians at the American Library in Paris. And so coming from my background, I want to ask a lot about Cassidy Blake. It's, it's one I recommend to our very younger readers who I hope some are in our audience tonight. Um, so the first one is set in Paris. Uh, the first one set in Edinburgh. The second one is in Paris. The third one is going to be in New Orleans. Orleans. Yeah. What about those cities particularly drew you to write? Was it their ghost mythology as such? <laughs> or? Yeah, so for those who don't know, the City of Ghost series or the Cassidy Blake series is about a young girl who <laughs> almost drowns or she does drown and a ghost saves her life. He pulls her back into the land of the living and she pulls him out of the land of the dead and now they're tethered together and she can see ghosts and, and cross to the kind of liminal space where they live. And if that's not complicated enough, her parents have just been hired to film a television show about the world's most haunted cities. So they travel to film this show. And, and one of the things I love about the series is that all of the ghost stories in the books are real. So they're all local legends. So the book set in Edinburgh, every one of the ghost stories that I reference, every one of the ghost stories that her family investigates for the TV show, all local legend, same for Paris, same for New Orleans, with the exception of the one at the center that she's fighting. Um, and I knew it because I moved to Edinburgh. We were discussing this before we started recording. So I live in Edinburgh. I'm, I live in France right now because of lockdown and I have for the last 10, uh, 10 years. That's what it feels like, 10 months. Um, but before that, I live in Edinburgh. Edinburgh, as, as you probably know, one of the most haunted places in the world and in a very um, grounded way. Like it, what's weird is an, an American 
who then lives in Scotland is how blase people are about ghosts. Like there's not really a sense of do you or don't you believe places are just simply haunted. And, and so I became fascinated by this idea that everyone you met in Edinburgh had their own ghost story. It was just one of those things like everyone has tastes, everyone has a favorite drink, everyone has their own ghost story. And I loved this idea of going places and asking people, well, what's your ghost story? So I knew I wanted to tell ghost story set in Edinburgh because it's just such an energetically haunted place. And then when it came time to pick the second city, you know, I'd been to Paris numerous times. Obviously it's famous for the catacombs, but I got to go down this deep dive of ghost stories of Paris. And, and it was just a delight, you know, learning about different ghost stories in Notre Dame, in the Pont Marie Bridge in like everywhere you go. And I think something I loved about the catacombs is realizing how much, how, how much space they took up. So this sense that people don't think of Paris as a haunted city. You know, it's a city of light and beauty and love and warmth and pastry and culture. And you don't think about the fact like Edinburgh, it hits you in the face with how haunted it is. It's just, you get there, it's gray, it's drizzly. You can feel ghosts. You're like, yeah, this place is haunted. And I loved that Paris was kind of the opposite that you were walking on bones most of the time and that you didn't really always think about it in that way. So that excited me. And then New Orleans is just, it's one of the most haunted places in the world, but it's certainly one of the most haunted places in the United States. So I knew I had to bring Cassidy home and I had to take her to a place that is just vibrant with every man manner of supernatural energy possible. And so it became really exciting because I would pick cities and I would really go down this research rabbit hole looking up all of these local lore and legends and then I would visit the cities multiple times and take ghost tours and speak to people and kind of amalgamate everybody's own little hauntings. Um, and that was your middle grade, that's your series for middle graders. Um, what, writing from teens and adults, what then attracted you to writing? What appealed to you to, for writing to, for younger readers? I wanted to write a scary story. And I think that children are absolutely amazing at scary stories. We think, oh, they're children, we need to protect them. Children are so much better at being afraid. They have this incredible ability to withstand it. I think we as adults put a lot of our own fears on them, this desire to protect them. Whereas young readers are so talented and so skilled at taking what they want at putting something down when it's not what they want. There is a willingness to embark on fear. And I also think it's really an important time to learn as a reader, the control that you have. Like, think about it. If you're a young reader learning to be afraid with a book, the beautiful thing about a book as compared to regular life is you can put a book down. And so I think that scary stories, specifically scary stories for younger readers, is an incredible opportunity at such a vital moment for them to learn the power that they have and the control that they have as readers. That makes me very happy as, <laughs> as a children's Also, like, they're just far braver than adults. Far yeah, braver. Totally. Um, so I want to ask, um, you publish under two names. Victoria Swab for teens and adults um, and V.E. Swab um, for adults, for Victoria for kids and teens. Can you talk to why that is for those that probably don't know the question yeah. that I'm making, but um, and why and has that been helpful? Has it been positive, negative? How do you how do you feel about having those two? Yeah, I think if I could go back, I would only be V.E. Schwab. Be and so I, I, I changed the name for two reasons. One was because I had written adult books. And then when I, I Vicious and my first kind of, I wrote a book for children for like younger than middle grade uh, came out at the same time. And I didn't want anyone to inadvertently pick up uh, Vicious, which had an illustrated cover to start and think that it was anything else. And to, that's not to say, I believe in like letting readers determine whether or not they're ready for something because I had a young, a, a young boy, maybe 10, come up to me at a book event last about a year and a half ago. And he was like, you're my favorite writer. And he held out a book and I took it assuming it was going to be City of Ghosts and it was vicious. So like they can do it as they please. 
So originally it was this sense of, I wanted to have a separation of church and state. But the truth is the more I embarked on fantasy and adult, adult fantasy, um, science fiction and fantasy, especially in the United States is an extremely sexist industry where a huge number of readers will not even pick up a certain kind of book if it's by a woman. Like I've lost count of the number of fans, fans of my work that have come up to me at book events and said, I'm so glad I didn't know you were a woman. I never would have picked this up. And it's mind boggling to me, but I'm the kind of writer who's like, I would rather you not make those assumptions and fine, go in not knowing who I am, fall in love with my book, and then you have to deal with your bias, you know? Um, so it's difficult. From an aesthetics perspective, I like V.E. Schwab more. It fits on a cover. It's much neater. My full name is Victoria Elizabeth. It's very cumbersome. But, um, but yeah, honestly, it was to combat a lot of the bias in my own industry. And was that by your choice? Was that suggested or was it? It was my choice. In fact, my editor, uh, Miriam Weinberg, did not want me to do it. She was like, screw those people. Like, we don't want them anyway. And I'm much more cunning and cutthroat. And I was like, no, I want them. And then I want to make them eat their words or, or change their assumption and then go out and help be that change. Because we're not going to change if people just don't pick up the books in the first place. You know? And so... I just, I felt like I'd rather be a converter. <laughs> yeah. Be the yeah. change you want to see in the world. <laughs> um, now, you talked about being very active online earlier. Um, myself and the library follow you. You're very active um, in talking about yourself, your writing, um, and the writing community online, especially during lockdown. I love the no right way. Yeah you did but how do you balance doing all of that and living so much online versus having your privacy your creativity to yourself mm -hmm. how <laughs> it's difficult and I will be really honest I made changes this year um and there's something also that happens and I hope this comes off the right way because it don't want it to sound narcissistic as your readership grows there is a very strange dehumanization that takes place. And so as my readership was growing, people were treating me less like a person and more like a commodity. And they felt as though they could say anything to me, no matter how abusive or harassing. And I wasn't permitted to respond because I had a larger following count and it became exhausting and really dehumanizing. And so one of the biggest changes I had to make this year was I essentially, I quit Twitter like last summer. It was the most beautiful decision I've ever made, mostly because I realized I was spending all my time on Twitter and I had no energy left for actually creating. So it was feeding. So I've had to make some changes. I will say I exist on Instagram a lot because I started so young and, and nobody was being honest. Nobody was being transparent. Nobody was talking about the industry. And something I really wanted to do is make sure that I talked about creativity and the industry and how alone it can make you feel and how, you know what, it doesn't matter if you've written zero books or, or 500 books, you still, your feelings are valid. And I think sometimes when we don't talk honestly about the creative process, then we feel alone because we look at other people succeeding and we think, oh, well, my struggle must be a reflection of the fact I'm not good enough instead of the fact that creating is hard, even in ideal times. And so I didn't want to give up social media entirely because I think that transparency is deeply important. I just needed a few more boundaries. So that's the thing I've had to struggle with. It's one of the reasons I moved to Scotland was because it gave me a buffer of like six hours to work and to write before American internet woke up, which is not to say that American internet is the internet, but like American publishing, um, certain, like my friends, you know, I like wanted a little bit of time to create before feeling like I needed to go into publishing mode. And so I think it's a learning experience. And I think much like everything in our lives, we don't have to make a decision of one way to be or one way to engage and be married to that forever. Like just as we're always evolving as people were allowed to have our our presence online evolve as well. Um, I want to open up to the audience for, for Q&As in just one moment. One last question that I would love to ask, obviously being a library and being a nonprofit, um, I wanted to ask 
really from your perspective, like what do libraries mean to you? I mean, they mean everything. They, they're extraordinary. So I read probably 120 books a year. And I would say that more than 60 of those come from the library. We have a library system in the States called Overdrive, which allows you to like, yeah, download. Uh, uh, it's a saving grace to me. Like, it's such a beautiful thing. I, I think that it's not one medium or another, right? You don't have to choose buying books or checking books out. You can support your library and your community and buy books and recommend. I will often use the library as a way to test things as well. Like I'll read it and then if I love it then I'll buy my own copy or I'll recommend it. But I think, you know, library accessibility is so vital from a cost perspective, but from a community perspective as well. And, and I love it deeply for that. Beautiful answer, we love it. Okay, so I'm gonna open for questions for the audience. I'm going to moderate still because I don't want any any spoilers, okay? Um, and I probably won't get to everybody because I know that we're short in time because I have so many other questions that I <laughs> wish I could ask you. Um, so I'm going to give me a second. All right, so you're getting wonderful feedback from people if you can look at the chat. <laughs> um, someone, Pascal Cartwright, um, asks what was your inspiration for the different worlds different londons in a darker shade of magic um yeah as i said i just really wanted to take a different approach to world building and so instead of making geographical differences i thought i'm going to take a city with a well-known kind of blueprint uh, and i'm going to reduce it to its most essential scaffolding and then i'm going to build new worlds on top of it based on a connection or a disconnection with magic all right. Um, so the other people have picked up. Obviously, we didn't have time. I didn't have time to ask you about the comics mm -hmm. the yes. to the darker shade of magic. How did you feel changing? So one of the questions was, how did you feel changing from going from characters in the books to the heroes we love to the people in the comics? I have, hold on, I have one, two, and three. Um, I absolutely loved it. I'll just take out one. I love it. stuck. Um, so this is one of the comics and they're set in the Shades of Magic world before 30 years before Darker Shade Magic. I loved it because I couldn't tell every story I wanted to tell. And as the Shades of Magic books move forward in time, the comics gave me an opportunity to move backwards and do a prequel without kind of bogging itself down. And so to get to visualize magic in that way. And in fact, my next comic is actually called Extraordinary and it's set in the vicious world between vicious and vengeful. Will Victor and Eli be in those? Comics? They will make an appearance, yes. Um, spoiler not included for everyone else. Um, so Saya asks, um, how did you find your first agent and have you been with the same agent for your entire career? I have not. I found my first agent when I was 19 through uh, like a competition. It was like I entered um, a sample competition and then I was given uh, a chance to query this agent. And I ended up querying multiple agents at that time. I signed with somebody, uh, it didn't work out. And that's sometimes the case is like, you're not always gonna stay with your same agent. And so about three years later, I signed with Holly Root, who has been my agent for the last 10 years. Wonderful. Um, so Luna asks, um, hello, Victoria. Um, I want to ask if you have read any Colombian authors. I don't know. I don't, I'm not recently at least. And I'm always really excited to receive recommendations online. Um, mostly because I'm just always trying to expand who's on my radar. I think uh, the English market suffers greatly from a lack of translation and that I don't think we translate nearly enough titles into English. Um, and so, and unfortunately I only read French and English. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, if they, if it's available for translation, like I'm always, always excited to learn about new books. Okay. And Marines just asked a question that I would love to know the answer for. Um, hello, are you working on a sequel for the villain series? Are you working, you're working on book three. Can you tell us anything about? Um, it? book three is called Victorious. So vicious, vengeful, victorious. And it will probably be several years because those books tend to be about five years apart. And it's not just because like of an aesthetic choice. It's just, I also had to write Addie and I've got the Shades of Magic or the Threads of Power books, which are four, five, and six in Shades of Magic. And I have a book that hasn't been announced yet. And so it's just me trying to juggle. And unfortunately there's only one cook in this particular kitchen, so. 
Um, okay. I'm looking through the comments. Um, threads of power. So someone's asking about the movies, but I'm not going to yeah. really ask about that. Um, but threads of power. Will everyone from a conjuring of light make, make okay. an appearance? So well, here's the thing. Threads of Power, which is the next arc in Shades of Magic, is set seven years after the end of Conjuring of Light. If a character survived a Conjuring of Light, they will be very important in Threads of Power. If they didn't survive, this is not vicious, so they probably won't come back. <laughs> But still no animal deaths, I'm going to No, that. there will never be animal deaths. The only time I've ever murdered an animal was in Vicious, and he came right back, so it doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Pauline, one of our wonderful volunteers from the library, asks, is there a book you read recently and you would like to recommend to everyone listening? Yeah, so I recommend people going to my Goodreads page because the only thing I use my Goodreads page for is tracking the books that I read each year. And I say that because honestly, I, I've read so many good things recently. Uh, and what I do at the, if you also, if you go to my Instagram, what I do at the end of each kind of year is not only show everything I read, but I kind of highlight my 10 favorites. So I don't want to, I'm terrible at being put on the spot with book recommendations because my mind just goes completely blank, but um, definitely look up my author page on Goodreads to see everything I've been reading. Wonderful. Um, Julie C asks, how do you feel when you see an illustration of one of your characters? I get so excited because one of the reasons I love the comics is because it's like professionally commissioned fan art. And I think as a writer, Fan art is one of the greatest gifts we can receive because it tells us how, how close our descriptions are to what people are envisioning. So when I see a character like Kel from Shades of Magic who always looks the same, or Lila Bard who always looks the same, that's so exciting to me because it means I've done something right. It's really interesting to me how different all of the Addie LaRue's look. And I kind of love that because she's a character that is, is so much more amorphous, but I love it. Fan art's probably my favorite part of scanning the internet each day. Someone else has asked, do you, do you read any of your fan fiction? I don't. I know it exists. And sometimes I search the tags on AO3 because I get really excited to see the tags. But there's a lot of legal murkiness in that, like, if I were to read a piece of fan fiction and then something com comparable showed up in a future book, that would be very bad. So I resist the urge. Also, it makes me kind of cringy because it's like the same thing all authors get very cringy about listening to their own audiobooks. Cause you're like, nah, that's my words. Um, and so cringy, not because anything's bad, but cringy just because it's almost like an uncanny experience. Okay. I know we're really running out of time. I'm going to ask one more before we let you go. And so the last question I've got in was what experience or travel inspired you, inspired you the most? I did that. Oh my God. I'm going to give a non-answer. I will say this. I will say this. Um, when I was 22, 23, I was living in Liverpool and it was terrible. No offense to Liverpool. I had a very bad living experience. I was living in a garden shed in someone's backyard in Liverpool. And I was miserable enough that I did two things while I was there. I went to the Lake District and I took a hike and it was on that hike that I thought of Addie LaRue. And the other thing I did was I took a train trip to Edinburgh for the very first time in my life. And the moment I stepped off the train, it felt like all of the silt in my body just settled to the ground. So while that was the worst living experience I've ever had, it made two of the most formative things in my entire life happen. Wonderful. I just thought one last question. <laughs> so at the library, we run um, a writing contest for young authors. It's short stories, young authors fiction festival. So the last question I've gotten is what advice would you give to young authors who are finishing their first draft? First, congratulations, because honestly, finishing anything, whether it's a short story, a novelette, or a novella, a novel, is an extraordinary feat. Also remember that then you get to go back and make it better. I think you should never be afraid of revision. Revision is the place when, you, as I said earlier, you get to add the light back to the orb, right? Revision is a chance to work with raw material and to make it shine. And so I would just say, embrace that. Nothing that you write is written in blood or stone. It is a living document and you have an opportunity to play with it and to make it shine. 
That is a wonderful way to end. I wish I have so many more questions to ask you. I wish we had another three hours of time, but I'm going to pass it back over to Catherine just to end our event. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. This has been so wonderful to listen to. I don't think we've ever had so much engagement in the chat box. So congratulations on this lovely conversation. And thank you so much, Kirsty, for moderating. And of course, Victoria, for being here and speaking to our community. Um, I just have a couple more words of thanks before we end. And then I'll wrap up with a, with a short announcement as well before I let everybody go. Um, so I just wanted to thank um, Victoria's international team. So specifically, uh, Kristen Dwyer and Remy uh, Ponce, who have been so wonderful in helping us reschedule this event and all of their flexibility and help promoting it as well and reaching many of you in the audience who I'm not sure knew about the library before this evening. So I hope that you guys do check us out. Um, maybe visit our homepage to see if there are any other upcoming events that you might be interested in. And we would love to also welcome you um, to, to the library in person. We're still open for the moment. Um, we're doing, uh, you know, you can browse for books and, and come in for sort of limited study time if you'd like to. So we'll see if we're, if we're confined in the next days here. But in any case, um, we have plenty of virtual and sort of digital resources as well that are very, very useful and will help get you through any sort of confinement we might be facing here again in France. Um, also, I wanted to thank our sponsor for the Evenings with an Author series, uh, Grow at Annenberg. And finally, remind everybody that the American Library in Paris is a nonprofit institution and we definitely welcome donations. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, if you'd like to support the library, I invite you to just click on that link that went out with the, with the Zoom link actually in the same email just above, you'll find a link um, to donate if that's something you're interested in doing. And we generally welcome about 10 euros per person per event. So that, that'll be a, a very wonderful gift and a way to show your appreciation. Um, and then finally, we have uh, just a really fun announcement for next week. We'll be hosting Stephen Clark. So a lot of the, the locals here, especially the Anglophone locals in Paris, I think really love his work. So that event is happening uh, next Tuesday and you can register on our homepage just like you did for this event. So again, thank you everybody so much. This has just been absolutely wonderful and I hope to see you again very soon. All right, thank you, Victoria and Christy. Bye. Bye, thank you.